crowd that had gathered heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This crowd praised him. They celebrated his miracles and with great expectation told everyone about him. But they did not know him. They were waiting for someone who would rule with strength and might, but he came as a humble servant. They wanted him to finally bring their people glory, but he wanted to change them so their lives would bring God glory. They were expecting a general who would crush their enemies, but he came saying, love your enemies. They thought he could offer them deliverance from their oppressors, but he came offering deliverance from sin. This crowd would soon realize that Jesus wasn't going to be what they wanted, and they turned on him before they ever realized he was what they needed. So as they yelled, crucify, Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Jesus answered, I am not that kind of king. His kingdom isn't what you see here. It won't be established by chaos and war. His kingdom is in our hearts. His kingdom is truth. His kingdom is goodness. His kingdom is righteousness. He is the humble king, the king of healing, the king of forgiveness, the king of love. Today, we lift our voices. We cry, Hosanna, save us. Save us from our sin. Come dwell in our hearts. Hosanna, we worship you. Jesus Christ, our King. Hosanna. Hosanna to the Son of David. Lord Jesus, come save us. Is He your King? Is He the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes, that's why we are the church, because He has given us a reason to be the church. The Bible says, this is the word of faith that we proclaim, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you shall be saved. Salvation is the gift of God to everyone who believes in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of King Jesus Christ. It's not by works, so you are not a boastful person, so it's not about pride. It's all about what Jesus came to do for us. But boy, we've never got it so wrong as on that Palm Sunday, right? So many expectations. And there is Jesus coming, riding on a donkey, humble, meek, as a servant. What was the world waiting for? What were people expecting of Jesus Christ? A king? A king riding on a white horse? A king commanding armies? A king that would set the Jewish people free from the oppression of the Roman Empire? What were we, what, what, what were we expecting? You know, we all have expectations, right? We all have expectations, and that is not a problem. We should have expectations. Because it is important for those who believe in God that expect that He shows up. Expectations are not the problem. As long as they are, rightly based on the promises of God. The problem comes when our expectations are just our expectations and not God's promises. On Palm Sunday, Jesus came to Jerusalem as the promised king, but he was coming to finish a journey that had started a long, long time ago. We are in our church going through a, a preaching series that we've called The New Normal, because, guys, we are trying to gain a, a, a new sense of normalcy with COVID and everything else of what our life is all about. And on this first uh, series, uh, this first section of our series, we're talking about the foundation of worship. When God brought the people of Israel back to the promised land from exile, he told them he was going to be present with them. He told them that he had a plan, and that plan was good. That plan was filled with hope. That plan was filled with goodness, with peace. But they would have to seek God with all of their heart. They would have to pray and really look for Him. When we return to worship, 
God promises that we will find him. When we repent and return to him and make him the center of our lives, God has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That was a promise that God gave through Moses in Deuteronomy. Right before they were going to enter the promised land. And as they come back, God reminds them again, I will be with you. And when Jesus the King, risen from the dead, meets his disciples again in the mountain and gives them the great commission, says, Behold, I'm going to be with you always, always to the end of the age. Because make no mistake, Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he will, he will speak with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And every one of those that have ever trusted him will not be put to shame. Even from the dust, even from the dead, Jesus will call our bodies. And will unite our spirits. And we will partake of the same resurrection, of the same life that flows through his recent veins. We will share the life of God. Life eternal. That's the promise of the gospel. That's what gets us out of our houses, even if people are fearful with COVID. That's what gives us a message to proclaim. That's why we are the church. But never, never did we get it so wrong as on that Palm Sunday. Never did we get it so wrong on that Palm Sunday. Because, yes, people look at the appearance of things and they saw what Jesus could do, his miracles, and they thought, certainly, this is the king. And many cried, Hosanna, come save us. But the salvation that we want is not always the salvation that God wants. You know what we want? Bread and circus. Give me the money. Heal my diseases. Give me a better house, a better job, a nicer face. There's plastic surgery, friends, right? Make me thinner. Make me stronger. Make me... Let me just tell you, if you're not asking God to make you more like Jesus Christ, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time because the only thing worthy this side of heaven is becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. But never, never did we get it so wrong as on that Palm Sunday. Never. Because people looked at the appearance of things and they didn't look at the substance of what God was going to do on that week that changed the world. That little video we watched. The writer said something fascinating. He says, Jesus wasn't going to be what they wanted. And they turned on him before they ever realized he was what they needed. I need to chew on that for a minute. I need to think about that for a second. Many times, we come to God with our expectations of what we want from him. Many times, we come with a long list of expectations of what we want to see in worship. It happens all the time. Nothing wrong with that. You want to experience the presence of God. You want to know that you are not singing to the ceiling, right? You are entering into the presence of Almighty God. But be careful. Because coming into the presence of Almighty God, it is always in God's terms. Not yours, not mine. And thanks to Jesus Christ, right now we have freedom to access God's throne of grace. Through Jesus Christ, God is graceful to you. But if you were living in the Old Testament... I didn't care if you were the son of the high priest. You could be consumed by fire if you did it the wrong way. Been reading your Bible, right? Been reading your Bible. You know what happened to Nathan and, and to the sons of Aaron. They died. You and I come to God with a long list of expectations. Make sure that those expectations are God's. Because when we come to God just to get what we want, we run the big risk of not getting what we truly need. People said on that Palm Sunday, oh, save us. And then just a few days later, they would be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And they killed the author of life. You and I, when we worship the Lord, can be distracted by the appearance of things and miss the substance of what God wants to provide for us, what we truly need. Never did we get it so wrong and on that, as on that first Palm Sunday. So how are we gonna get it right? So come with me. This journey started many, many, many years ago. We're gonna be today again in the book of the prophet Haggai. Haggai, <coughs> no, it's Haggai, that's his name. Haggai is an Old Testament prophet 
uh, apostolic prophet. This prophet prophesied in the time when the people of God came back to Jerusalem, rebuilding under Zerubbabel, and then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. That's what we've been talking about. And just so you get the historical context, we are more or less in the time of Ezra chapter 5. We talked about that last week. Remember, in Ezra chapter 4 and 5, we said basically this. God has invited us to come and worship him, to lay a new foundation of worship. We need to be able to make him first. We need to, make him, we need to be able to make him best. But here's the thing. We need to do our part knowing that there are things that only God can do. When we do our part and God does his part, we come together and then we're part of God's plan. So how does it work? God told them, build the temple, build this new foundation of worship. And I will take, take care of the heart of the king. Even the king is going to work for you. Let me just tell you this, church family. When we are in God's plan, even Satan himself, he doesn't want to. But even Satan himself ends up doing the purposes of God. This is everything we live in this broken world. One day, Jesus Christ will redeem through the power of his gospel. Until that happens, he's inviting us to join him. Everything that sin has cursed, God's grace can redeem. So through Jesus Christ, salvation is real. And he's inviting us to come to him and lay a new foundation of worship. So in Ezra chapter 4 and Ezra chapter 5, laughing, there, was, there were mixed emotions. And God told them, it's going to get better, guys. It's going to get better. Just stick to me. It's going to get better. And he told them, it's time to between those events and what we're going to read today in Haggai, about a few months, about six, seven months. And people, it's amazing how easily distracted we are, right? We can come to Sunday worship and hear the word of God and sing, worthy is the lamb. And then as soon as we get out of here, we start fighting about what we're going to have for lunch, right? So easily distracted we are. But God, in his mercy, brings us back again and again to him. So here's the question we're going to tackle today. In a world that changes and is so superficial, how do we go beyond the superficiality of our ever-changing worship preferences? You get me there? Our ever-changing worship preferences. What are those? The preacher you prefer? The pew where you sit? The music that you like? We can name some more if you want me to. You know them better than I do, right? Our ever-changing worship preference. Let me, just tell, let me just tell you this. You and I don't worship the way people worship a hundred years ago. You and I don't worship the way Luther or Calvin or those apostolic fathers or even the apostles did in on the surface. There are some things that change and there are some things that should never change. But our preferences, not convictions, not our doctrine, not God's message, our preferences change all the time. And I'll tell you why. Because maybe I'm the only sinner, but there are mornings, Sunday mornings, when your pastor doesn't want to come say anything and see anyone. There are moments when I wake up on Sunday morning, I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I could stay a little bit longer in bed, right? <laughs> Bedside Baptist Church sounds a lot better than First Baptist, right? <laughs> but let me just tell you this. Every time I come and worship him and fellowship, my preferences step aside and God meets my needs yeah. and I have never regretted ever in my life saying yes to Jesus because he always meets me right where I need him so how do we go beyond the superficiality of our ever-changing worship preferences to the abiding substance of what God wants in worship worship as we will talk today is not about what you and I want it's about what God wants and that's the message of the prophet Haggai to the captives as they come back today. Haggai chapter 2. We're going to read a few verses right there. Haggai chapter 2. We're going to see that in our ever-changing preferences, there are three things that God wants us to remember to stay focused on what truly matters, on the never-changing realities of what God wants for worship, not our preferences. So Haggai chapter 2. We're going to read verse 1 to verse 9. Follow with me. It says, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Speak now up to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? 
Raise your hand. Who is? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come. Come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The, la the later glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace declares the Lord of hosts. Wow. What a powerful word of encouragement. What does God want us to remember in our ever-changing worship preferences? He wants us to remember three things. Here's the first one. The first one is this. True worship. True worship is not rooted on personal preferences, but on God's unchanging word. How do I know that? I want you to see in chapter 2 again, verse 1, the timing of the words of the prophet Haggai. When did it happen? On the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month. Now, if you haven't downloaded your notes, your sermon notes, I'm going to encourage you to do that at some point. Right there in front of you, you have those little bookmarks, marks with the QR code, right? You see those in front of you? Pick one of those up. Those are free. You can take them home. If you scan them with your phone, this is going to give you access to our newsletter, The Journey. You can see the sermon notes right there. And the reason I'm telling you that is that we're going to have quite a few verses today to cover. They are all right there for your reference if you want to see them right there. Now, why is this timing so important? Guys, the seventh month is a very significant time for Israel because the Passover is the beginning of the calendar year and then the seventh month in the fall was a reminder for the people of Israel of what their identity as a nation was all about. In the seventh month, the Day of Atonement took place where God gave a lesson for the people of Israel to remember how they were reconciled to himself. The, the innocent victim that was killed to pay for the sins of people as a substitute in faith that God would cover their sins. But not only that, on the seventh month also, the people of Israel were supposed to celebrate the Feast of Booths, the Tabernacles. And that feast reminded them that they were captive in Egypt. Let, let me give you a few references. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 34 to 43. I want you to hear what God told them right there in Leviticus that they should be celebrating. Chapter 23, verse 34 to 43. It says, the Lord... Um, hold on a second. Right here, 33. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, On the 15th day of this seventh month and for seven days in the Feast of Booths to the Lord, on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. The people of Israel gathered in Passover to remember it is the Lamb of God that brings us freedom. And then in the Day of Atonement, it is the Lamb of God that gives us forgiveness. And then they would celebrate the Feast of Booth saying, saying this, we are strangers and aliens in this land. Even if we are in the promised land, our God is, is a sojourner with us. Remember when Jesus in John chapter 1, John talks about seeing his glory? He says the word became flesh and he dwelt among us in John chapter 1. That word dwelt among us is the word that could be translated as, as said, uh, said his tabernacle among us. The Feast of Booths was a reminder that just as the Israelites had gone through the desert with God at the center of their lives, they were strangers and aliens in this foreign land. Does that sound familiar? There is nothing more alien to a fallen world than the worship of the one true God. You know why? Because as sinners, we don't belong in his presence. But through his sacrificial provision, we have a chance to be reconciled with him. Later on, interestingly, in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 8.2, you can, it's right in your notes. 1 Kings 8.2, we are told when Solomon built the first temple, they dedicated the temple 
right at the Feast of Booths. How significant is that? Incredibly significant. You know what God is telling them? The Feast of Booths, by the way, one more thing. If you're, if you're doing our Bible reading plan, I couldn't have planned this better. And I didn't plan it, but God is bigger than me, right? God is in control. Right now we're finishing in our personal reading plan, finishing Deuteronomy, right? And we're reading the Gospel of Luke as well. You know what people read during the Feast of Booths? The book of Deuteronomy. So, in Deuteronomy, again and again, you hear the words of God saying, these words that I'm giving you, they are to set them on your heart. They are for you to practice them. This Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord, but those who are revealed are for us and for our children to do, to believe, to obey all the words of the law written here. Every single time they gather for worship at the Feast of Booths, they would hear that worship, the worship of the people of Israel was not about what they felt. That, those were the pagans. You know what the worship, worship for the pagans was? It was a sensual worship. Sensual means from the senses. What you want to perceive, what you want to hear, what you like. The worship of the one true God is based on obedience to his word. It's based on a faith that seeks to obey what God has revealed about himself. His revelation is not feeling. You do not have to like it to be able to love it. You have to know that it is true and it's coming from God. So right here at the beginning, you have people in worship. And God asked them the question, how many of you were in the first temple? Can you imagine? There were some survivors that had seen Solomon's temple. This little shack compared to the glory and magnificence of Solomon. I mean, they were in shambles. That doesn't happen to us, right? Oh, no, you, do, you and I don't remember the years when First Baptist Duncanville had 150 in the choir. Right? Oh, my goodness, I remember those youth trips and all that stuff. We can get really, really nostalgic about the surface of things and miss the reality of things. I'm not saying anything. There's nothing wrong with big choirs. Great. I love choirs. I love hymns. I love all of that. But what happens when those things that are the expression of who we truly are in obedience to the word are no longer there? Do you still give your heart to this God? And does he still deserve your allegiance just because he says so? Or do you have to have all the fixings to say, oh, yeah, I really do like this church? Yeah. So God talks to them and tells to the people that were there, how many of you were there? Uh, okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, a few of you. Isn't this house like nothing? When you look at the surface of things, it may be like the people of God at times are falling apart, right? We're falling apart. But that's just the surface. Because when God looks at our heart, God is looking for truth and obedience and faith. And that you have to dig a little bit deeper than just what you see. God says, is it not like nothing in your eyes? Don't be deceived. God says, I'm right here in the midst of it. What makes worship worship is not how well we sing. It's not how nice our facilities look. It's the presence of Almighty God who dwells with the meek, who dwells with the humble, who dwells who, with those who tremble at His word. Do you tremble at His word? Or are you a person that is like, oh gosh, that same passage again, for God so loved the world. Are you kidding me? Yeah. All eternity will not be enough to proclaim what Jesus Christ has done for us. If you get tired of John 3, 16, you're going to be really tired in heaven if you make it. <laughs> if you make it. But here is the thing. God tells the people, guys, don't be distracted by the superficial things that you see in this new temple. Because I'll tell you this, I have great plans. I have great plans and they're not going to be frustrated. But first things first, make sure your worship, as you just read Deuteronomy, your worship is based in obedience to my word. The first temple was all about, about obeying the word of God. The sacrifice was all about following on his provision. And then they forgot in their idolatry. First thing he says it's all about my word. Don't be distracted. Don't think this is like nothing. But there is one more thing. True worship celebrates the past, looks forward to the future, but above all, I don't want you to miss this, to miss this, above all, strengthens us to experience the reality of God's presence today. Did you see that? Read with me again. 
It says in verse 3, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? It is, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet, now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. Yeah. Guys, we got to celebrate the history and the heritage that we got, right? God told the people of Israel, don't forget where I got you out of. Don't forget my faithfulness in the journey. Don't forget. In fact, if you read this week also, one of the passages we read this week in our personal Bible reading plan, the people of Israel were supposed to come to the, to the, to the city where God was going to make his name dwell on, and they would confess, I, my father was a Syrian. That wasn't a journey. Their whole story, right? They would confess who they were for God, looking and celebrating God's faithfulness in the past. We always look at the past where our roots are deep. You got to have deep roots. You got to have them. But if all you have is roots, sooner or later, you're going to die. Those roots are the foundation. But you got to grow up and reach out. You look at the past. God told them, I'm going to be faithful just as that covenant that I, I did with your parents when I took them out of Egypt. But then I want you to look ahead. I want you to look at the future because I still have plans. The nations will bring their glory. The nations will bring their honor to this earth. Um, a, a passage I want to share with you, Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 7. Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 7. Listen to what God told them. This is just beautiful on how he encouraged the people. He says, then uh, 31... I'm going to start on nine. As you notice, I don't have my glasses today, right? Talking about the appearance of things and superficial things. I sit down and I'm getting ready to go preach and I'm like, oh, I don't have my glasses. So this is going to be a sermon by faith, not by sight. So guys, bear with me. I'm doing my best right here, right? So this is when you know if your pastor studied or not, right? Here we go. So then Moses wrote this law, verse 9, Deuteronomy 31, 9 says, Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord in all, and all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, remember? Tabernacles, at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of their release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord, your God, in the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, little ones, the sojourner with your towns, that, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all of the words of this law. You hear that? True worship is about obedience to the law of God. But the word of God. But true worship is also about remembering that even though we're hundreds of years later in the book of Haggai of what happened then, it is still relevant. We are a faith with deep roots in the past, but we're a faith that looks forward to the future because God's still working in our midst. But, but, he, but here's my favorite part right there in Haggai. He tells them about the future and the vision and everything. But here's, here's what he doesn't want you to miss. He says in verse, verse um, again in Haggai 2, uh, verse 4, he says, be, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all the people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Did you hear that? Work, for I am with you, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Have you ever felt so lonely that you read your Bible and you're like, God, where are you? When you feel the loneliest, he's the closest. Keep trusting. Keep depending on him. Because he wants to change your life because his spirit is with, with us. When you look at the past or you look at the future, we can get into generational wars, right? What do you prefer, the old or the new? And then here we are bickering. God says, it's not about the past only. It's not about the future only. It's about my presence right here, right now. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is as well. If we cannot agree on his presence right here, right now, we're just looking at the surface of things. Dig deeper. When you obey his word, he makes himself present. Guys, we need to be a church that every time you come to worship him, you're meeting with him. And you really are talking to him. And you really are hearing from him. You may leave this place saying, oh, you know what? I didn't like everything. That's okay. You don't have to like it to love it. God is not asking you to like it. God is not asking you to like neither the music nor the preacher. He's asking you to hear his word, 
and obey what he says and live for his glory, knowing that he's present right here, right now. Right here, right now. So, don't miss his presence today. Last thing I want to share with you today. True worship preserves a strong legacy for the future generations. Notice the words of Haggai in verse, <laughs> one of those verses. <laughs> yeah. I think it's verse 6. We'll take it on faith. It says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations. Did you hear that? I will shake the nations. What makes you shake? What makes you shake? What stirs your heart? That's a phrase that repeats in Ezra again and again. God stirs the, stirs the spirit. God is going to shake this world in such a way, Hebrews says, that even the mountains will, will, will be moved out of their place. There's not, not many of those in Texas, but don't let that bother you, right? He's going to make a way to bring the nations to himself. That's what he's saying right here. He's bringing people to himself. He says, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house. Now, by the way, that phrase, the treasures of nations, is a very difficult Hebrew, Hebrew phrase to translate, and there is some, some debate. Some translations tra trans translate this as the desire of all nations. The rabbis and many Jewish people interpret this as a prophetic oracle about the coming of the Messiah. What is God saying right here? This house, this foundation of worship you're laying here is precisely what I need so that the good news of Messiah continue generation after generation after generation so that when he comes with salvation, people will know that it is me. Let me tell you what excites me the most about today. I hope you're planning and staying to have some fellowship with the lunch we're going to have right after the service. We're going to start serving right away. It's going to be really, really fun. This church can be, if we want it to be, can be a place where the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, is welcome. Not on the surface, but deep down in the obedience of our hearts. Never, ever, ever, ever did we get it so wrong as on that first Palm Sunday. But today, today we have a chance to get it right. Today we have a chance to tell him, Lord Jesus, today you are the King. You are the Lord and Savior of my life. So let me finish with this. True worship is not about liking what we do for God, but about doing what God commands because we love him. Worship is not about what we like, but about who we love. You don't have to like it to love him. Pray with me. As you're praying this morning, as we continue to worship, I have something really special for you to share with you in a minute. But as you're praying, back there in our care center, there is a book for you. This is a book that's going to help you walk through Palm Sunday and through Easter. It's called Suffering and Glory. There's one for every family. Pick one per family. It's free for you. Take it home so you can reflect on this very special season for us. And as we're praying about true worship, I want you to think on your own heart and make a commitment to obeying the Lord with all your heart. Tell him, Lord, I'm here to obey your word. Not what I like, not what I want, not my will, but let yours be done. Your will on earth as it is in heaven. Father, thank you for this morning. We worship you. As we respond in song and in fellowship, Lord, you, you have changed our lives. You have changed our lives, so we worship you. And this special moment we're about to share on how you change our lives, Lord, is how we say, Hosanna, come save us. We thank you for loving us. Even if we are superficial, you're not. You're the real thing. And we need you. We need your truth. We need the reality of who you are in our lives. I want to obey you and believe you all the days of my life. We sing to you, Lord Jesus. And we give as well. In Jesus' name, amen.